Hello everybody, I'm Ajit K. Mishra, your course instructor for literature and coping skills. I'm back with another segment of the course. If you remember, until now, we have been talking about literary experiences, starting with existential concerns, emotional well-being, personality, and then higher order thinking alongside simulation and emotional intelligence and empathy. So when we look at these forms of literary experience, you will definitely come to know that they are important and our interactions with literary texts helps us not only develop these skills, but also reaffirm those skills through focused understanding of each one of them. Then we moved to the next segment that was poetry and healing. And while discussing that particular segment, I told you how poetry is extremely important, extremely useful in helping us treat our mental challenges in order to help us take care of our everyday mental well-being issues. So that was how we focused on a variety of aspects related to poetry and healing, starting with poetry therapy and then moving to verbal imagery and healing and finally coming to the power of rhetoric and prosody. So I'm sure you might have passed through these stages with utmost focus. If you have done so, then you must have been able to understand the power of literary experience and the power of poetic healing. That is how we come to the next segment, starting with this segment until the end of this course, we'll be focusing on a variety of practical issues, application issues. I was in fact preparing you all for these application issues to come. So I'm going to focus on a variety of things each week, starting this week. And for this week, I have in mind the ideas associated with fear. Fear because it's one of our most basic emotions. If you remember and if you can recall our basic emotions, then you can quickly associate your mind with the idea of fear. So happiness, sadness, fear and anger are the four most basic human emotions that we all experience every now and then. When it comes to fear, it is something that we all experience all the times. And it's, it's not something that happens in the case of the other emotions like happiness or sadness. We do not become sad every time, always. We're not happy always either. And similarly, we're not angry always. We may be angry for a certain period of time, maybe a prolonged period of time, but we are not angry ever, always. But when it comes to fear, it's something that doesn't leave us even for a moment. We are constantly hounded by fear. Therefore, it's very important that we all start with the idea of fear and how it in fact affects our existence, how it affects our behavior, our emotional responses, and how it affects our overall well-being status. So, our understanding of fear is very important. Not only that, at the end of this segment, you'll be in a position to understand how fear can be taken care of. With the help of certain literary texts, I have tried to do so. If you remember, I talked about how literary texts are in fact wonderful simulated worlds that help us immerse, that help us engage in the activities that go on in those walls. And then when we come out, we come out wiser because we have participated in those activities. So therefore, it's important that we pick literary texts and then see how these particular things happen, take place, so that we can develop certain coping skills. And with the help of those coping skills, we can devise certain coping strategies to help us take care of these challenges to our emotional well-being on a regular basis. 
So it's very important that we take care of these issues. So let's take a look at each of these components today. This segment is otherwise called conquering fear because we all know that until and unless we are able to conquer fear, we are able to defeat fear, we will not be able to get rid of fear. I don't say that once you conquer fear, fear will not return to you. No, that cannot be the case because fear will never leave us even for a moment. I have already told you all that. So, what's important here is that fear, once conquered, will give you an ability, an understanding of how to conquer it on a regular basis. It will keep coming. It will come back to you stronger. But once you know how to conquer, how to take care of fear, you are prepared. You know how to do that because you have done that once. So that's the idea. With the kind of coping skills that you develop, when we pass through these literary pieces, especially poems that have been chosen with utmost care, so that they give you a wonderful experience of how to take care of fear. So you're going to develop those abilities in you and we're also going to help others develop those abilities or skills in them as well. So that's the whole idea for this week. I'm going to focus in fear and anxiety. But for the sake of convenience, I'm going to focus in the, the, the idea of fear first and then in my next lecture, I'll be focusing on the idea of anxiety. For the sake of convenience, I have kept them separate because they are a little different from each other, although most people think that fear and anxiety are the same. But they have certain subtle differences. When fear is, is all about observable danger, anxiety is not necessarily that. It's highly diffuse. It's unfocused. So it is characterized by the absence of an object because it's objectless. So therefore, uh, we need to understand these uh, subtle differences between fear and anxiety. Although they are very closely associated, they are different. And that's the reason why I have kept them separate for our understanding of each one of them. So let's focus on what I'm going to do today. So I'm going to focus on fear. I mean, the moment I talk about fear or you think about the idea of fear, you get a variety of images in your mind. So fearful faces, uh, you know, dropped jaws, eyes uh, wide open, gaped mouths. You can imagine if I ask you to draw a few images of fear, you can do that easily because you know how fear brings about certain changes to your facial contours. So therefore, uh, this is one such image that will probably give an idea of what fear uh, is and how it looks like and how it in fact affects our uh, body language. So today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, what is fear so that we understand the different forms of fear, the types of uh, fear and then I'm going to focus on fear and the brain. So while talking about the psychology of fear, I'm also going to link it with the neurobiology of fear so that we get to understand it even better. So then I'll be talking about fear triggers, those causes that in fact produce fear in us. Although I have already told you that fear is very, very inherent. It doesn't go. But these are the causes that bring that inherent fear up in a, in a strong manner. So the fear triggers are important for us to understand. And then I'm going to talk about fear responses, how we respond to fear when we are faced with it. And then the function of fear. Does fear perform any function or the only function that it has is to keep us in a challenged, distressed and disturbed state. So let's check the functions of fear as well. And then finally, how to manage fear because uh, fear is something that in fact poses a great deal of challenge to our well-being, especially 
our psychological or emotional well-being. So it's very important that we learn, we, we develop skills to manage our fear so that it doesn't destroy us. Fear is okay, it will never ever leave us. But to, to surrender to fear, to succumb to the pressure of overwhelming fear is never a good idea. Therefore, it's always a good idea to develop certain management skills with the help of which we can overcome fear. So these are the things that I'm going to talk about in this particular lecture. So let's take a look at each one of them. So we'll start with what is fear. The moment I ask you this question, you may definitely get a variety of ideas in your mind. Fear is this, fear is that, fear is um, not this, fear is not that. Okay, so it's quite natural because we all know what fear is, because we all experience fear. So let's uh, uh, take, an Im I mean, uh, take an image and try to draw certain ideas out of it. So is that fear according to you? Of course. It's nothing, it comes out of us. And th that's, that's what the image is trying to tell us. It comes out of us because it is, it is very much inside us. And when does that happen? When we allow fear to come out of us and try to scare us, frighten us. First, you know, become huge and then try to scare and frighten us. We do not know what to do then because it's become so strong and huge that we don't know what exactly to do about it. So that is how fear emerges as strong, huge, scary and frightening. So fear is, uh, we all know it's a universal emotion that is experienced by everyone around the world. It's not that we Indians are, are more scared, more fearful uh, in comparison to the, the US people or the UK people. And the UK people are less fearful in comparison to the Chinese people or the Korean people. That's not the case. It is a universally felt, universally experienced emotion. So fear is experienced almost in the same way everyone or by everyone and everywhere around the world. So it's universal. And then fear is, we all know it's a challenging emotion because uh, the moment we begin to experience fear, we have a certain challenge right in front of us. There is an object, it can be a real one, it can be an imagined one, but there is an object, there is an observable danger and therefore that makes us feel fearful because that challenges us, that poses a huge challenge right in front of us. And you all know, the moment we have a challenge right in front of us, we promptly uh, move to the survival mode. And we are out of the safe mode and then we move to the survival mode. And once in the survival mode, we know that we have to struggle in order to overcome that challenge. Because the challenge will gradually become large and then it will begin to scare us, like this image. So we also know that it is an unavoidable facet of our existence. We, we cannot uh, avoid it. Even if we want to avoid it, we cannot. How are you going to avoid fear? It's so integral to our existence that we cannot do anything about it. So experiencing fear is very, very natural and universal because it's an inseparable part, integral part of our existence. So we cannot avoid fear. So when you know you cannot avoid fear, you have to do a few things about it. So how does fear arise? Fear generally arises with a threat of harm. It can be physical, emotional, or even psychological. It can be real or imagined. So the moment we think there is some kind of harm, something is going to harm us, 
It can be a physical thing. For example, you suddenly find yourself right in front of a speeding car. You begin to think that that car is going to harm you because it's going to crush you if you do not get out of its way. So that's physical. Okay. Even, I mean, uh, the moment you see uh, a rabbit dog barking dog right in front of you, you feel it's going to harm you probably because that's, that's physical. And there is, there is emotional uh, stimulus as well that can cause a similar type of harm to you and you're scared of it. It can be an emotional harm. So it can also be psychological harm. So fearing uh, being bullied by your schoolmates, your classmates. So that, that's a kind of psychological threat. So, so you'll not like to go to school or you'll not like to go to your college, your institution, because you think you'll be bullied every time you go there. So it's, it's a kind of psychological harm or threat that will you know, cause a great amount of fear in you. So it can be real or it can be imagined. For example, you're imagining that uh, you're being crushed by a car or speeding car. That can also cause a great amount of fear in you. But there's a difference between the real and the imagined uh, causes of fear. So when it's imagined, you know uh, that is not going to cause you any actual harm since it's going to be short-lived. If it's a real, that's going to cause you an actual harm. So we'll come to those issues in a while. Now this is the most important aspect about fear. We all know that fear is uh, a challenging emotion. It is a distressing, disturbing emotion. And it promptly pushes us to the survival mode. It, it uh, takes us out of the safe mode and pushes us towards or into the survival mode. Therefore, it's not a friendly emotion. It's not a good emotion to experience. We all dislike fear. And that's the reason why, you know, uh, human civilization has um, detested the idea of fear. Okay, because they always associate it with the idea of cowardice. So therefore, fear has been an abominable, uh, detestable uh, human emotion. So fear has been accorded all those negative connotations. And therefore, we shun fear, we dislike fear, we hate it strongly. So, but when we look at the idea of fear, when we approach the idea of fear as an emotion, we understand that it's not as bad as it has been painted to be. It has a brighter side to it as well. And it, it in fact uh, offers us a world of opportunities. So while traditionally it's considered to be a negative emotion, fear in fact mobilizes us to cope with potential danger. Just imagine you find yourself uh, right in front of a speeding car. What exactly are you going to do? You're going to protect, you're going to save yourself, you're not going to surrender to that fear. Because we are evolutionarily designed in order to return to the safe mode in order to overcome, struggle and overcome our distressing emotions. So that is, that is uh, the beauty of this evolutionary design. So fear in fact helps us cope with potential danger. So if you're experiencing fear, that means you have an opportunity to develop certain coping skills in you. And so therefore fear need not be shunned. Fear need not be hated or disliked. So uh, we have uh, just taken uh, uh, a closer look at various ideas associated with fear. I think you might have been able to look at both the sides of fear. So let's take a look at the other components. So once you begin to take care of uh, fear, and once you know that fear is, in fact, extremely helpful 
in developing certain coping skills in you, the fear will gradually begin to disappear. So, we now come to the idea of forms of fear. So, when you take a close look at this image, it's very popularly called the fear cliff. So, you can see various cliff images here. So, it all begins with uh, trepidation, then moves to nervousness, anxiety, dread, desperation, panic, horror, and then finally terror. So, when you look at the horizontal axis, you find that we start with the least intense fear forms or fear types and then move gradually towards the most intense. Now, the idea is if we do not know how to take care of our fear, if we do not develop the skills to convert fear into something positive, something exhilarating, exciting, then we will gradually get trapped inside the fear spiral. And once that happens, we will spin around, spin around and finally hit the rock bottom. And when that happens, we will be unable to move out of it. Because the spiral will gradually narrow down and then you will feel choked at the bottom of it. So, it's not never a good idea to allow fear to overwhelm you. If I can take back to the image that I showed you a while ago, if you allow fear to emerge out of you, a huge, strong and gigantically, that it becomes unmanageable, that will lead to problems for you, definitely. So it's always a good idea to focus on these types, these forms of fear, so that we know how to keep it to a manageable limit. I repeat, fear will never ever leave us. It is here to stay with us. So the whole idea is to learn how to cope with it, how to manage it. So in order to be able to manage fear properly, it's, it's important, it's imperative that we get to know the different forms of fear. So if I can focus the idea of uh, uh, the least intense forms of fear, let's start with trepidation. So it's kind of apprehension. You are fearing, you do not know what it is. You, you experience, since it is very much within you, you experience that there is something that is fearful. That's trepidation, which is not a problem for you at this stage, because it's very, very mild and manageable. So we all experience apprehension, nervousness, fear of a mild variety, a mild kind. So that's not a problem at all. That's an indication that we are existing well. We are properly living. Therefore, we are experiencing fear. We have not become insulated to it. Okay. And then, if we do not contain fear at that particular stage, it will become a little stiff and bigger. And it will get converted into nervousness. So, you will not be able to perform your everyday activities with ease and confidence. You'll become nervous. It's not that you'll stop performing your everyday activities. You'll do that, but with a lot of nervousness. You'll show nervousness for almost every activity that you perform every day. So, that will become larger. The fear factor, the fear form will become larger and it will lead to nervousness. So, you'll constantly feel nervousness in everything that you do. If it is not contained at that stage, it will be even bigger. It will turn into anxiety. So, the difference between fear and anxiety is that fear is qualified or characterized by an object, whereas anxiety is not. It's a kind of formless, objectless fear. It's very, very diffuse in nature. 
So fear is anxiety, which is objectless, which is so diffuse that we cannot pinpoint, we cannot name it. It becomes extremely difficult for us to manage anxiety. So anxiety will become larger than trepidation or nervousness. If it's not taken care of, even at this stage, it will turn into dread and the cliff will become stiffer and sharper because it will begin to disturb you substantially. It will begin to affect your mental well-being substantially. Therefore, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to overcome this particular kind of fear. So it's, it's an extreme kind of anxiety, that is dread. So if dread is not taken care of, it will turn into desperation. So you'll become hopeless. You'll not find hope anywhere. Once you become hopeless, you'll not want to do anything. You will begin to withdraw from your everyday activities and you will gradually become dysfunctional. So, because desperation has taken over you, hopelessness rules over you, overwhelms you. Then it will turn into panic. You will experience the panic button pressed every now and then. So you'll begin to fear everything. You'll begin to fear your environment, your surrounding people around you. You'll begin to fear you know, uh, the chairs, the tables, the pen, your laptop, everything around you because you will press that panic button every now and then. So that will become even stiffer and sharper. And then horror. You know, once you find yourself in that position, you'll be in a state of shock. And once you're in a state of shock and the executive brain will stop working, it will not send the right kind of signals, the right kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, overcoming or coping signals to you. And then you'll not know what to do. You'll be completely frozen, overwhelmed in that particular stage. And then finally, you come to the sharpest of it all. That is terror. So you'll begin to tremble. You'll develop an array of mental challenges, mental problems in you. That is how people experience fear at different stages. So these are the different forms of fear. Some of them are manageable because they are least intense or less intense. Some of them become absolutely unmanageable because they are so intense that they will not allow you an opportunity to manage them. They are extremely sharp and they are so strong that they will promptly overwhelm. So that is that's uh, why it's very important that we understand these uh, forms of fear so that we know where to contain them. Trepidation is okay. You're apprehensive of certain activities. That's okay. Nervousness is okay because you're going to write an exam. It's quite obvious. It's quite natural that you become nervous. Anxiety is okay because you're going to face an interview panel. You'll definitely be anxious. That's not going to disturb you. But anything beyond that, starting with dread, desperation, panic, horror, and then terror, is definitely going to cause a lot of problems to all of us. So it's it's very, very important that we we understand. But then you can see that those darker areas, um, each of these forms has the darker areas as well. So trepidation, if it's prolonged, will definitely cause problems. Similarly, nervousness, anxiety, if they are prolonged, they are going to cause a lot of trouble to you as well. So we need to cut down on this particular aspect of these forms of fear. So it's, it's important that we begin to understand these forms and then we also begin to manage these forms of fear. So that brings us to the idea of fear in the brain. 
uh, as I have already told you that uh, it's important that we understand the neurobiology of fear so that we get to know how it works and how it affects our overall well-being. So uh, this is an image to suggest uh, those parts of the brain that in fact you know come into act or action whenever we experience these emotions including fear so and it's very important for you to understand that this bean sized or peanut sized area that is called amygdala is the most important area because it in fact regulates all our emotional responses or reactions in association with the prefrontal cortex very popularly called pfc and even the the, the the medial prefrontal cortex, the hypo, um, you know, thalamus, the hippocampus, all these areas get activated whenever we are faced with certain emotional stimulus. So amygdala, uh, in fact, uh, regulates all our responses and reactions. So it also prepares us for the fight or flight responses or instincts. So, uh, whenever there is a threat stimulus, it can be anything, it can be a speeding car, it can be a snake, it can be a barking dog, whatever is a threat stimulus, that triggers a fear response in us. And that fear response is registered, it's triggered in the amygdala. Because amygdala is the integrative center for emotions and emotional behavior, as I have already told you. So, any fearful or threat stimulus will definitely trigger a fear response in the amygdala. It all begins here. And then this activates areas that are involved in the preparation for the motor functions, involved in our fight or flight responses. Uh, for example, in association with uh, the medial pre frontal cortex and the hippocampus. So all this will become activated and then prepare us for the fight or flight responses. This also um, is going to trigger the release of stress hormones and uh, like cortisol. And then simultaneously it also activates the autonomic nervous system. If you remember, I talked about autonomic nervous system while talking about uh, simulation and higher order thinking. So uh, an important part of the autonomic nervous system is the sympathetic nervous system, the SNS. So the sympathetic nervous system will make you experience that emotion. It will grow stronger in you. It will lead to heartbeat, uh, increased heartbeat. Um, pounding, racing heart, it can lead to palpitation, swearing, even some kind of trembling, a variety of uh, uh, physiological changes in your body. So the sympathetic nervous system gets activated. And then finally, the prefrontal cortex, uh, which is located here, you can see in that uh, highlighted area in yellow in the image, so the prefrontal cortex helps the brain interpret the perceived threat contextually. Now this is very, very important because there's something that's very, very interesting um, when it come, uh, comes to the interpretation of a threat stimulus by the brain, especially by the prefrontal cortex of the brain. I'll, I'll uh, cite an example to explain this. For example, you visit a zoo, you see a lion inside the cage. Although you'll experience some fear, but the prefrontal cortex will help the brain interpret the perceived threat in a very different manner. You'll not be very, very afraid. You know that you are very safe. So you you not realize that you are suddenly moving out of the safe state or safe mode and you are entering the survival mode because you know that there is a cage to protect you, not 
to confine the lion. The cage, in fact, protects you and it makes you feel safe. So the brain will interpret that particular context in a different manner. You'll not be extremely afraid. Although you'll experience very mild fear, it will not be afraid. On the other hand, imagine that you're faced with a lion and there is no cage. Right in front of you, you see a lion. Now the prefrontal cortex will interpret that particular context in a different manner. So the prefrontal cortex um, you know, plays an important role in the interpretation of the threat stimulus contextually. So that's, that's how uh, we can understand the brain functions uh, um, when it experiences the fear emotion. So these are some of the fear triggers. Uh, I'll take you quickly to the idea of uh, fear triggers so that you understand the basic and the most important causes of our fear. It can be specific objects or situations. For example, there is a situation in which uh, you um, unwillingly enter into a fight with somebody. If you suddenly realize that person is stronger enough to overpower you, you'll experience fear. So it can be the fear of a specific object or situation. It can be uh, flying an airplane. So fear of flying an airplane, fear of um, you know, diving into the swimming pool. It can be a specific object or fear of anything for that matter, which is an object. Or it can be a situation that will trigger fear in you. And then it can also be imagined events. But then even in imagined events, you are able to see those objects. You are imagining something. You are imagining that you are losing something you're, you're uh, getting injured, uh, you're being crushed by uh, a speeding car, um, you, you're uh, being taken away by zombies. So anything can be imagined. But then uh, even in your imagination, the object needs to be observable. And then we come to the idea of the unknown, fear of the unknown. We do not know that, but it continues to scare us, make us afraid of it. And then social interaction or rejection. So that will cause a great amount of fear in us. People stop moving out, people stop seeing friends, and uh, people stop going to social gatherings because they fear a rejection. Public speaking is such, I mean, uh, uh, a fearful area because uh, people think they may be rejected, they may not be accepted. So there are people who fear public speaking. They're very comfortable when speaking uh, informally with their friends, but they they are very very uh, scared, afraid when it comes to public speaking, because they fear rejection. And then the fear of death and dying. Although um, death and dying. Um, have to do with anxiety more than fear uh, because uh, these are objectless things. But then uh, when we see uh, people dying right in front of our eyes, uh, we experience fear. So death and dying also cause trigger fear right in front of us. So for example, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, whenever we um, listen to the news of people dying, because of this virus, we would be afraid. We would experience fear. So uh, death and dying can also cause fear in us. Then failure, we all know. We all are uh, afraid of failing. We all are scared of failing. So that's one big reason why most people do not even try to attempt. Because they're so scared, so afraid of failing. And then finally, the fear of loss. We are constantly hounded by this particular fear. So the idea of loss causes a lot of fear in us. We may lose um, our near ones, our dear ones. Uh, I may lose my smartphone. So that's also um, is a cause of a great amount of fear in me. So I, I, I may lose uh, my uh, limbs. It can, it can be anything. So the idea of loss 
triggers a great deal of fear in us. So, how do we respond when it comes to fear situations or threat stimuli? How do we respond to uh, fear uh, forms? So, this is called a specific uh, uh, defense reaction, and this is species specific. So, therefore, it's very popularly called SSDR, species specific defense reaction. So, when it comes to the human species, uh, it's characterized by three specific defense reactions. So, the first is freeze. That means you are suddenly faced with uh, our, our fear stimulus, a threat stimulus, and your executive brain stops functioning. You don't exactly know what to do about it. You are so hounded, so shocked, that you suddenly get frozen. So that's why this, this particular stage is called the freeze uh, stage, because uh, uh, it's so natural to us, uh, because it's rooted in the evolutionary response. We freeze. Uh, for example, you might have seen uh, how the other uh, species of animals uh, um, behave. They suddenly stop whenever they sense a threat stimulus. They do not make any movement. So the humans also do that. So there are two ways of doing it. One is to protect yourself from the predator, and the other is, you know, you have suddenly lost contact with yourself. You don't know what to do. You're so shocked. Therefore, you're frozen. The other response is this particular one with which we are extremely familiar now. The flight response. We begin to run away from the imminent danger, the threat stimulus. So, so that we can protect ourselves, we can uh, make ourselves safe. So that's a very, very natural response to, uh, it's, it's a natural instinct to take a flight, to run away from the threat stimulus. And then we come to the fight uh, stage, the fight reaction or fight response. So, when you know you cannot get away from the threat stimulus, you cannot uh, run away from it, you're left with no other option but to fight. For example, you do not know swimming and somebody pushes you into a river. What exactly are you going to do? Are you going to stop doing anything? If you enter a state of shock, if you're frozen, then you will not do anything, you will allow yourself to be drowned. If you have not frozen, if you are not experiencing a great amount of shock, that means you are going to do things to fight and come out. Even if, I mean, you are not able or successful in coming out, you will still fight. So, the fighting instinct will be activated. So, that is how we humans uh, respond to the threat uh, stimuli or fear uh, stimuli. Uh, through these uh, forms. Uh, I can quickly uh, take you back to uh, something that I have already talked about. If you remember Vatruhari's uh, fear of death that I talked about while talking about existential concerns, uh, lecture 2. Uh, so, you can see how um, wisely Vatruhari had listed uh, various types of fear various kinds of fear that we all experience every day, every moment. So, fear of disease, uh, fear of losing caste, fear of tyrants, fear of losing honor, fear of enemies, fear of, you know, aging and developing wrinkles, fear of defeat, fear of scandal, fear of death. And then, he goes into say that everything our whole life is fraught with fear. That's exactly what I told you at the beginning of this lecture, that we cannot escape fear. It's so basic to our existence. It's so integral to our existence. So therefore, what is the way out? The way out is this. Renunciation alone is fearless. By renunciation, he doesn't necessarily mean that we'll stop doing everything, we'll withdraw from our life, our existence, and we'll not feel any fear. No, that's not the thing. Renunciation means 
renounce fear and then embrace life. Do things that will help you overcome fear. We'll take a quick look at what they are. So if renunciation happens, then fear can disappear. So I'll quickly take you through the functions of fear. We have already discussed some of these functions. So we know that uh, fear gives us a signal of danger, threat or even motivational conflict. And at the same time, fear also triggers appropriate adaptive responses. So we just talked about adaptive responses. Two of those adaptive responses are flight and fight. Freeze is not an adaptive response. There are times when freeze can be an adaptive response. So if we can include these uh, SSDR responses, starting with freezing, then running and then fighting, we can call them adaptive responses. So fear while giving signals of danger, threat and conflict also triggers our adaptive responses. So that way fear is not negative alone. It has a brighter side as well. Then fear can uh, keep us uh, feeling trapped and prevent us from breaking free. If we do not, you know, promptly resort to adaptive responses, if we do not activate our adaptive responses to fear stimuli, that means we'll gradually get trapped within the fear spiral and it'll be extremely difficult for us to break free. And then uh, uh, fear also helps us do things that we, uh, we couldn't imagine. So there are various other ways. For example, you, you suddenly uh, pushed inside uh, or into a river by somebody and you do not know swimming. So you'll do uh, things. You'll suddenly be hounded by fear. And you'll begin to do things to fight that particular fear stimulus that's being inside water. And you'll do things to come out of the water and protect yourself, preserve yourself. So you may you know, throw your hands, you may do things. If you finally come out of it, then you suddenly discover you could do that. You had never imagined that you could ever you know, defeat getting drowned and come out of it and preserve yourself. So that's the power of fear. So fear is not negative alone. That, that brings us to the idea of managing fear because it's very, very important that we learn how to manage fear. Unless we do that, fear will continue to disturb us and it will finally destroy us. We'll um, enter the extreme and the sharpest form of fear that is terror. So this is uh, how we all start with uh, because the moment we are faced with fear, the panic button is promptly pressed and we begin to panic. We do not know what to do. We begin to howl, growl and you, know, you try to run in all directions because we are panic stricken. And then the inertia stage, the frozen stage, you don't know what to do because the executive brain has stopped functioning and it's stopped sending the right kind of signals to your right brain, the creative brain. So you do not know what to do because you do not know how to cope with that particular challenge. So that is the stage of inertia. You are completely frozen. You don't know what to do. And then if you're not completely frozen if that fighting instinct is still active it's not completely switched off then it will begin to strive struggle there's a the struggling stage we all struggle with fear okay so because we all start with a panic stage and then we go to the inertia stage we don't know what to do because our mind doesn't find any responses to that particular challenge 
then at the same time as I have already told you all that we are evolutionarily designed to fight our way back into the safe mode and that's exactly what helps us struggle and strive to return to that safe mode. So the striving stage will definitely try to move forward and do things in order to help us overcome that particular challenge. And that will take us to the coping stage. Now we know what to do, how to focus on that particular challenge so that we can overcome those challenges and return to the safe mode. And when that happens, when we are successful in coping those, uh, coping with those challenges, we'll enter the actualization stage. Now we can rejoice, we can be happy because we have discovered how to overcome that fearful stimulus. So therefore, we have discovered, we have not been able to overcome the fear only. At the same time, we have also discovered, we have devised strategies to overcome that particular fear in a certain way, in a certain manner. So we have every reason to rejoice because that is the actualization. The actualization stage is very, very important because it gives you insights into two very important things. It helps you overcome that fear. At the same time, it instills a particular coping skill in you. So managing a fear passes through these stages. So managing fear is also about fighting your fear stimulus. So how do you fight your fear stimulus? So, but before uh, that, uh, let's take a quick look at this particular uh, statement. Um, every time your fear is invited up, every time you recognize it and smile at it, your fear will lose some of its strength. So, that's, that's the power of fear. It's taken from Heng, a Vietnamese Zen leader, Vietnamese monk and a Zen leader, Heng. So, he's very right in saying that. So, all we have to do is to invite our fear. Come to me, show me your face. And then, recognizing our fear. The moment we begin to do that, we are actually fighting our fear. So, that's the power of fighting your fear. How do you do that? By visualizing yourself as unafraid. You're not afraid. So the moment you accept that you're afraid, if you visualize your fearful faces, that will reflect on your actions as well. So the way we think, the way we imagine, the way we feel get reflected in our actions as well. So if you visualize yourself as unafraid, you can fight your fear well. Then name your fear. If you have a certain type of fear, try to name it. If you remember, I talked about name it to tame it, Dan Siegel's popular concept. So you name your fear. The moment you begin to name it, that means you're inviting, you are recognizing it. So that way, your fear is losing its strength. It will not grow bigger or larger than you are. And then confront your fears. And that's exactly where you need certain coping skills. And we are going to talk about certain coping skills when we take up the poetic piece for analysis and discussion. So this is a, a very, very important thing because you need to avoid avoidance. So taking a flight, running away from your fear can help you remain secure for a short period. But until and unless you have fought and you have overcome your you know, gigantic fear, then you cannot contain it. So you need to avoid avoidance as well. 
and then deal with your fear directly. You don't need anybody's support to deal with your fear because it's your fear. It's very much within you and you have allowed it to grow larger in size, to grow bigger in size, to, uh, to become uh, stronger in proportion. So it's completely up to you to deal with your fear directly. So you have to devise each one of us has to devise a way with the help of which we can overcome our fear. So that is how we come to the end of this uh, lecture. I'm sure you might have uh, been able to uh, take a close look at the idea of fear, starting with the psychology of fear and then the neurobiology of fear, management of fear, which is a very, very important thing for all of us to do. So these are some of the uh, and the sources from where I have taken the ideas for this lecture. When we meet next, I'm going to talk about the psychology of anxiety. Thank you for joining me.